Here we are. We're live. Welcome to Journey Ministries Online. I'm so glad that you are joining us here today. And if you're in this room, thanks for being here today. And uh, we are looking at part two of staycation. And so we're learning what it means to live on mission. Uh, last week, we looked at what this meant. We looked at Jesus preaching uh, up on the mountain. We called this uh, his Sermon on the Mountain. Jesus was preaching up on the mountain. And then he came off this mountain, and he, and he started putting, putting what he was preaching, what he was teaching, he put this into action. And we, we saw how Jesus he talked to the, about the Good Samaritan, the story of the Good Samaritan, and how Jesus uh, listened to this, this person of the law, this religious person, and this religious person was saying, um, he, he was saying, uh, what does it mean to be the greatest? What does it mean to follow all of the rules? And he summed it up like this. He said, love the Lord God with everything that you have, and then love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so as we're looking at staycation here today, what does this mean? The question that I'm going to ask today is, what if the greatest thing you can do this summer is to know your neighbor? While we ask that question, let's pray real quick. God, again, it's amazing to be able to come before you. Lord, listening to the rain outside, the thunder, the lightning. God, thank you for protecting us. Thank you for protecting your equipment. Lord, as we move inside, thank you that we have this place that we can come to. Lord, we thank you for today. Lord, as we look at what it means to, uh, to love our neighbor, to what it means to love you better and to love the people around us more. And so God, help us to truly understand what that means and what that looks like in our life. God, we thank you that you are here today. Holy Spirit, speak through me. Help others to hear and to know exactly what's going on, God. It's in your name I pray. Amen. So the question is this. What if the greatest thing you can do this summer is to know your neighbor? As we look at this, we see that Jesus, I believe, modeled this really, really well. Again, Jesus was up on this mountain from last week. If you haven't seen that, you can go back onto our, our website and watch it right there, journeymen.org. But Jesus was up on the mountain. He was preaching. He was teaching. He had thousands of people off this mountain as he was preaching to them. And then he, he left the mountain. He came down, and he entered this place where he lived, Capernaum. And in Capernaum was the, the people that he lived with, his, his neighbors, the people around him. And Jesus, I believe, modeled loving God and loving people 
really, really well. He, li- he modeled this lifestyle of, of what is really important. Is all of us are busy. All of us have, have things in our life that are, are busy moments. What, what Jesus did is he came down off of that mountain and he walked with people, he talked with people, he listened to people, and he healed people. I'm going to switch the question on you. We asked last week, what if the greatest thing you can do this summer is to know your neighbor? Tonight, today, what we're going to do, if you're listening online, if you're in this room, what we are going to do is we're going to ask this question that says this. What if the greatest thing you can do this summer is to know your neighbor on purpose? Not just know them, like physically know their name or physically have a conversation with them at the mailbox, but you intentionally go out of your way to know your neighbor. Remember last week we, um, we saw that Jesus, through this story of, of uh, the Good Samaritan, Jesus set the bar really, really high. In fact, he told us to love our, our enemies, the, the people that are doing wrong to us, the people that are doing bad things to us. And Jesus set that bar really, really high. Last week I said, let's start the, set the bar as low as we possibly can and, and literally just love the person next door to us, our literal neighbor. And so what if we take this and we learn to love our neighbor on purpose. There's different ways that Jesus did this. For instance, uh, Jesus was walking one day, a blind man came up to him, and the blind man yelled out. He said, Father, have mercy on me. Jesus, have mercy on me. And the disciples, they considered this man a kind of a nuisance, a, a distraction to Jesus as he was trying to get someplace. But Jesus stopped, and he had a conversation with this blind man. Not only a conversation of, of listening and, and responding, but he had this conversation of understanding who this blind man was, and then he healed him. And there was another time when just Jesus was, he was teaching, and some little kids came up to Jesus. I, I picture Jesus by a tree just sitting there teaching, and, and these little kids, they came up, and they crowded around Jesus, and they be, began to sit around him or on his lap, maybe leaning on him, and the, again, the disciples, they got angry. They said, get away. They were shooing these kids away, getting them out of there. And Jesus, I, I fully believe that Jesus was sitting there, and he was, he was getting agitated with the disciples, the adults. The adults were thinking that these kids were, were um, a nuisance, a distraction to Jesus. But what did Jesus said? He said, let the little kids come to me. Wow. I, I fully believe that Jesus understood what it meant to train up the kids in the way that he should go. Even though he didn't have his own kids, he understood that part of his job as a neighbor was to help the kids around him. Another time, Jesus was called to an important community leader. He was walking on his way there to, to heal the, this daughter of the important community leader. He was on his way there, and, and while walking there, another lady came up to him and, and started talking to him and having conversation with him again. I can just see the disciples are saying, hey, stop, Jesus, we got to keep going. Like, this important community leader, she needs you. She needs, the daughter needs you. And again, Jesus paused. He stopped, and he listened to this lady who was, who was struggling, who was hurt, and he had conversations with the sick lady and then he healed her again. And then he continued to go on to the community leader's home where he could heal the daughter. We have example after example of, of Jesus' busy life. He, he was busy moving around. He was busy doing things. He was busy preaching, teaching. He was busy healing. But every single time somebody came up to him and said, heal me, help me, he was available. He was ready to listen in conversation and to respond with an action. That's what it means to love our neighbor on purpose. To not live such a busy lifestyle that we can't, you and I, that we can't have an inconvenience of a kid having a conversation or a neighbor having a conversation at the mailbox. How do we do this on purpose? And how, how do we love and how do we live like Jesus loved and lived? We have example after example of Jesus doing these things. Brian Mavis, he said this, he said, in this life, we can do only a few things really well. I think it is a good idea to make certain that one of those things is what Jesus says is most important. What did Jesus say was most important? For us to love God with everything that we have and to love our neighbor as ourself. And for us, in these next couple weeks, we mean our literal neighbor. The eight houses around us, the families around us, Jesus came off of this mountain you know, from where he was preaching. He was teaching. He was tired, 
but he put his love in practical ways in the community right around him, his neighbors. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Luke chapter 10, verse 38. I'll just go back a little bit. Right before this, Jesus just came off the mountain. Right before this, Jesus had that, that parable of the Good Samaritan, loving your enemy as you would love yourself. And then we see this where Jesus was, he was walking along and he gets to this, this house in this village called uh, the house of Ma- Martha. Luke tap, chapter 10, verse 38. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. You see, Jesus was coming off the mountain. He just did some, some good storytelling. He was coming into the, the place after doing some healings. He was coming into Martha's house to sit, to relax. We hear about Martha in actually three different spaces in the Bible. We hear about Martha right here. We hear about Martha when, his bro- when her brother uh, Lazarus died and Jesus came and brought him back to life. And we hear another time about Martha when, when Jesus was at their house and um, Mary was actually, Mary as Martha's sister, was actually washing Jesus' feet with this expensive perfume. Martha is here. She's getting ready for dinner. She's preparing dinner. She knows that Jesus is coming, and so they're going to have this moment together. Luke chapter 10, 39, it says, uh, And she said, had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. This is a really controversial move, actually. Jesus, Mary is sitting at a rabbi's feet, and, and the, that place of sitting at a rabbi's feet was strictly for students of this rabbi, his disciples. And so Mary is already sitting there, he, uh, sitting at her, his, Jesus' feet. And not only is she sitting there, but she's a she, woman, sitting at a rabbi's feet. Again, this is, an, this is unheard of in this culture, but here Mary is. She's sitting down at Jesus' feet, and Jesus receives her. He listens to her. He teaches her. Just like he did with all of the others, he was available to her. He spent his time with her. He takes time for her. There was three times, again, when we heard about Martha and Mary in Scripture. We saw Martha every single time being agitated and upset. Mary, three times she's at Jesus' feet. One time she was, right now, when she's just sitting there at her rabbi, her teacher's feet, and listening and having conversation. One time she was at Jesus' feet when, when Jesus was walking back into town. Lazarus was already passed away, and Mary hears that Jesus is coming into town, and so she throws herself at his feet, saying, well, come on, help me, my, my brother's dead. And then there's one more time when, Jesus, when Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet, and that's when she washes his feet with expensive oils. Life is busy. But Mary understood that in these three moments, in this busyness of life, Jesus is coming over. There's going to be, be times of, of cleaning and washing the dishes and, and getting the, the food prepped and ready. But in this moment, Mary sat at Jesus' feet. She was available to Jesus to be heard and to be taught. The second time, the death of her brother in mourning and grief and sorrow and pain, Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet. The last time in an act of worship, Jesus was sitting, or Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet in this act of worship. In busyness of life, she understood what needed to play, take place. And here she is, again, sitting at Jesus' feet. Luke chapter 10, verse 40, But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. Martha is distracted. She's cleaning. She's, she's sweeping. She's putting things away. She's cooking. She's busy. She's distracted. Jesus is literally sitting in the other room, and Martha is running around distracted. She's annoyed. She comes up to Jesus and says, don't you even care that my sister's just sitting here? You see, I think Martha's looking at Mary as being lazy at this moment. But what Mary is doing is she's worshiping God. I don't think, as I read through this, I don't think Martha was, was distracted by sin. Everything she was doing was good things. It has to be done. We have a guest over. We have to clean. We have to put things away. We have to cook. She's not doing sinful things. It's all good things. But the best thing was sitting right in the room next door feel like this is my life. My, I'm a Martha. 
I'm distracted by busyness of life, like all good things, not sinful things in my life. These things in my life are, are having conversations with people, going to the store and getting a loaf of bread, a stick of butter, and a gallon of milk, but putting my head down and going as fast as I can up and down the aisles so I'm not distracted, so I'm not, so I'm not uh, getting annoyed by the people around me. This is the exact same thing Martha's doing. She's not sinning, but she doesn't realize the best thing is sitting right there in the other room. We're not sinning when we're busy but we don't realize that the good stuff we are doing can be better by the best things. She's ready. Mary's ready to listen to God, to listen to Jesus. Luke chapter 10, verse 41. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her, you're anxious, you're troubled. I'm running to soccer games. I'm, I'm going to bi different band concerts. I'm running to the store. I'm trying to have a conversation with my neighbor, which I thought was going to last five minutes, but it lasted two hours. I, I'm trying to, to do the good things in life, but I'm anxious. I'm troubled by these things. Why? What Jesus said is because there's only one thing that is necessary. What is that one thing? To love God with everything that we have and to love people around us. You're troubled, you're anxious, but here's this one thing, love God better and love people more. But Mary has chosen this good portion, that, that wording right there, that good portion, that's actually from the Old Testament teachings to be closer to God. Mary has received a good portion because she's closer to Jesus at this moment. And then Jesus says, and this will never be taken away. Life is busy. We're living at a speed that we can't be interrupted. All good things, but are they the best things in your life? All good things, but are these things helping you take care of people's spiritual needs? All good things, but are you being distracted by the great commandment of love God and love people? Are the good things I'm doing more important than the great commandment of loving God and loving people? I'm daily talking with people all over the place. And through, even through this shutdown, people have said, I'm busy. There's work, there's family, there's church stuff, there's sports stuff, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm busy. One of the things we're trying to do here at Journey Ministries is we're trying to get rid of some of these sacred cows, some of this busyness of life that we've gotten ourselves into these habits of. We're trying to say, okay, this is good ministry, but what's best ministry? This is good to be able to be with the people, but what's best for God's kingdom? This is good to be able to, to have these conversations and these programmings and these ministries and these events, but what's best for the great commandment of loving God, loving people? As I was talking with Pastor Sean and Miss Jennifer, our children's director, this is the stuff that we're talking about in our staff meetings, is how can we do ministry best? Not just to fill the calendar with something else, but how can we be most God-honoring in these moments of busyness? We don't want to be a church that's so busy that we can't walk across the street to a neighbor. We don't want to be a church that's so busy with good things that we can't train up our own children in the way they should go. And so one of the things that's been happening is this. We've been developing some really good resources for you, and I would encourage you to get these things. One is from Pastor Sean it's called Journey Parents Ultimate Guide to Social Media and Apps. This is found on the website, journeymen.org, and go to the teen section. And what this is, is a, it's a parent's guide about everything that you can see. There's uh, Tinder, WhatsApp, Twitter, Fortnite, YouTube, uh, cyberbullying, teens and alcohol, LGBTQ+. Like, there is a lot of information inside of this book that Pastor Sean has put together. Why? Because we believe that 167 hours a week is with you as a parent or as a grandparent or as a neighbor, and we have that student for one hour a week. This, my friends, is going to help you love God and love neighbors better because you're training up your own kids or your neighborhood kids on how they should go. Another thing that we've developed, Miss Jennifer has been working really, really hard on this one. Uh, this is a, uh, a new box that we're releasing this month, 
it's a um, it's a uh, a ministry box. So think about like a subscription box that you would get in the mail with like nail polish in it every month. That's this right here, but instead of nail polish, it has God's word in it with with object lessons, hand on hands on touching tools, so that you can teach your kids better. So you can have your own simple block party youth ministry kids ministry right in your living room with your own neighbors. This is $5 a month. The only reason we put a price tag on it is because we realize that when people pay for things, they find they find that it's a worth something and they'll use it. If we just give these for free, they just get put up on the top shelf and they're never used. So we're asking $5 for that for that box. But listen, what we're trying to do is we're trying to help you do ministry at home. We realize we can have you come into the building. We realize that we can have you come into the places that we are doing things, but life is busy and we don't know your schedule. Yes, we're still going to have children's programming. Yes, we're going to still have youth ministry. But we also want to equip parents and grandparents and guardians and aunts and uncles and neighbors to be able to teach kids, to be able to teach teenagers. You might be asking, what about adults? Adults, we've had something for a long time called Right Now Media. Again, if you go on to journeymen.org, and I'll post these things on Facebook later, you'll be able to find the link to Right Now Media and sign up. It's free with thousands of Bible studies for you to watch at your own time at home. There's things on marriage. There's things on relationships. There's things about how to train up your kids. There's Bible studies through the books of the Bible. There's um, financial resources on there. Just so many resources on that Right Now Media app that you can get free from Journey Ministries. Again, we're trying to make it so that you are not a Martha running around busy, not being able to control life. We're trying to make it so that you personally, as an individual, can go simply across the street to your neighbor and say, Hi, I'm Dave. I'd love to have a conversation with you. My friends, we're doing this staycation on purpose because here at Journey Ministries, we believe that we invite invite people to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and we mentor them to Christ-like maturity. Yes, that happens as the body of Christ, the church, here in this room, outside of this building. But it also happens as individuals, you, training up your own kids, just like Jesus let the little children come to me. It's it's you walking to the mailbox and, and having a simple conversation with your neighbor. It's you inviting your friends over into playing Uno or, or some other game and starting those conversations about Jesus. It's taking the preaching, the teaching, coming off of the mountain, and it's putting God's love in practical ways to the world around us. Luke chapter 8, verse 14. Turn to your Bibles. Luke chapter 8, verse 14. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. My friends, so many people... So many people say that they are following Jesus. But what we're seeing is we're seeing that people are choked out by the cares, the inconveniences, the riches, the distractions, and they're not producing fruit. Church, Journey Ministries, we are as a body of Christ are trying to help you produce fruit. We want you to be a peach and then a peach tree starts next to you and another peach grows and another peach tree starts and another peach grows and we're producing fruit all over our community of Davis and in Genesee County and Lapeer County and, and all over the, the state of Michigan and all over the entire world because of what we're doing right here, simply walking across the street and talking to a neighbor, training up our kids, our own kids in the way that they should go. We're learning what it means to love God better and because of that, we're gonna love people more. We're intentionally, on purpose, saying, I'm going to go find my neighbor. I'm going to help them understand who Jesus is better. And I fully believe that when we literally do this, when we literally love God better, of course, we're going to love people more. And that's going to help us enjoy the day. Let's pray. God, again, we thank you. God, we thank you that we are able to love you better. Lord, help us to want to spend time with you in your word through prayer. Lord, help us to to want to spend time with you in devotion, sitting at your feet like Mary did as a student so we can hear you, we we can see you, we can hear your preaching, we can understand it. 
But God, help us to stand up from that moment. And as an act of worship, help us to walk across the street to our neighbors, to live life on mission as we invite people into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you, God. Lord, help us to see your teachings. Yes, you had an incredibly busy life, but you were available to the people around you in priority. You would listen. You would have conversations. And you wouldn't leave that person unchanged. Whether it be a physical matter or a spiritual matter, you changed each individual that you came in contact with. Lord, help us to do the same. Give us wisdom, Father. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Love God better. Love people more. Enjoy the day. Bye-bye.